It's a theory, right? So it's getting worked over by the theorists. Um, it's been out now about 12 years. It's derived from connectionism, which is a, an old theory in computer science that today we know of as deep learning, which is enjoying resurgent popularity. So on the artificial intelligence side, uh, it's very robust. On the educational side, there's been quite a bit of research being done. Uh, I'm noticing a number of publications coming out. I'm not really doing them. Um, you know, I'm sort of trying to find out what's next. But, uh, you know, it's being examined, being applied in a number of areas. And, of course, a major offshoot from connectivism is the MOOC. And there's been a lot of uh, experimentation and study in MOOCs. So MOOCs continue to be really popular. Um, I know the press and pundits say, you know, MOOCs are over. They're not over. Um, they're, the number of providers has multiplied. Uh, dozens of providers now. Uh, hundreds of MOOCs, millions of people taking MOOCs. I mentioned during my talk some figures that come from uh, Class Central, which is an aggregator of MOOCs. Uh, 2015, more people took MOOCs than in all years previous. And then in 2016, that number doubled. So, and of course, we're in 2017 now, and uh, we don't know what the total will be, but uh, there's no reason to believe they're slowing down. The other side of it, too, there's, especially now, a lot of the early academic research is coming out. Studies have been done. They've gone through peer review. They're being published. And people are beginning to see what MOOCs are good for, what they're not good for and where we might go from there, and where we might go, I think, is personal learning. The early providers were like Coursera and Udacity, and they were venture capitalist funded, which gave them a pretty limited window, right? And they've had to pivot a couple of times in order to extract revenue. You know, MOOCs are free open online courses. <laughs> Right. It's kind of hard to build a business model based on that. There have been a number of false starts, uh, a number of failed attempts. None of these companies are yet profitable, and so failed, right? But they haven't failed from the perspective of the learner. Uh, they're doing a really good job. They're providing access where there wasn't access before. But in terms of making a quick return for venture capitalists, not so much. And that's why you have this disconnect. One wag in the back channel said, what will I see first, a unicorn or a personal learning environment? Um, and the money was on unicorns, <laughs> uh, which kind of bothered me. Uh, it's slow, right? Uh, it's, and I've been working in personal learning environments, personal learning networks for the last five, six years. This is really hard technology. Take one aspect of that. The personal learning record, a single record for all of your educational achievements, certificates, badges, whatever, still eludes us. It eludes us because institutions don't want to share. It eludes us because there's no easy way to verify the information, to exchange the information. There's not, not even a good place to put the information. These are all things that are going to happen, though. Uh, there are things that are going to happen as the technology matures and as people have a place to put these things and to exchange this information, the need for that capacity will express itself. And, you know, I talked about personal learning environments a lot over the last six years. Everybody wants to see a personal learning record. Everybody. And so it's only a matter of time. Depends on the country, right? Uh, in Canada, I can see it. Um, you know, we have public health care. We're on the way to having a public health care record. We don't have it yet. But, you know, there isn't a big resistance to it. In the United States, there's a lot more skepticism of government. I don't know why, but it's there, right? And so it becomes less likely. So in an environment like the U.S., I would expect over time you'll get not one, but maybe two or three 
competing personal learning record initiatives from the private sector. In Canada or in Europe, I would expect a single government managed personal learning record. Um, but, you know, I mean, technology is funny that way. Uh, it might be, uh, you know, the personal learning record be, is like, you know, the Linux of educational technology and we go from nobody has one to everyone has one, it's just sort of there. Even in some of the talks today, there was, I mean, what was the, uh, the phrase that was used, social knowledge, social trust, social something, social truth. Um, but the idea was that, you know, you could upvote things or things like that. And that's really commonly how we see um, network knowledge expressed. Upvoting in Reddit, for example, or, um, you know, number of followers in Twitter, etc. Right? We very often evaluate a person's standing or capacity or influence by these kind of metrics. But these are measures of quantity. And this is something I tried to bring out in the talk a bit, right? They're, you're looking at something and seeing how much of something somebody got. But the wisdom of the crowds, quote unquote, isn't a quantitative thing. It's, I, I don't want to say qualitative because it's not that either. It's a, it's, I would say it's a connective form of knowledge. It's based on the structure and organization of the network rather than some quantitative metric within the network. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, a type of connective knowledge is knowing how to surf on a wave. Okay, There's a story behind that, but just take my word for it. Now, you don't quantify that you don't add up the number of successful waves you've surfed. Nobody would do that. Uh, you don't count the water molecules or anything like that. Successful surfing on a wave is responding to the wave in an appropriate way. And every wave is different. So there's no generalization, there's no abstraction. It's the knowledge is a lot deeper than that. And that knowledge is a production of your experience with waves. Not the number of waves, because if you surf the same wave a million times, you're not gonna be ready for a different wave, right? So you need different waves, different conditions, the right environment, the right mindset, deliberative practice, as they say, and then you have become a surfer. You haven't learned to surf, you haven't acquired from some external source surfing knowledge, you have physically become a person who when they look at a wave, they see it a certain way and they respond to it automatically. You see the difference between that sort of knowledge and counting votes, right? And you can see that they're substantially different kinds of things. And that's what I'm trying to get at when I talk about connective knowledge. Uh, and, and even social learning, social knowledge, and all of that. It's not about counting things. It's not about measuring things. It's about being in a certain frame of mind, being constituted a certain way to see the world in certain ways. And when you see the world in that way, that's when you begin to say, oh yeah, okay, I get it now, now I've learned. We think of knowledge as a subtract, right? We think uh, knowledge as though it's a proposition that it doesn't depend on any physical instantiation. Paris is the capital of France, right? It's just knowledge. It doesn't have to be written down. But in fact, what knowledge is, is the physical state of the brain. There's no difference between knowledge and the physical state of the brain. They are one and the same. So to learn, what you're actually doing is changing the physical state of the brain. You're actually changing it. It's a phenomenon in um, psychology and cognitive science known as plasticity. And it's a changing of the structure of the brain. You're adding connections between neurons. You're strengthening or weakening those connections, whatever, right? 
in response to experience, in response to practice, in response to feedback. That's what knowledge is. Surprisingly, a lot like it is now uh, in certain respects. I mean, this everybody's seen The Matrix, right? Where, uh, do you know how to fly a helicopter? Now I know. Uh, no, it's not going to be like that. Uh, simply because the knowledge of, say, how to fly a helicopter is physically different for each and every person, right? There isn't some plug-in that you could have that just plugs in and you can fly a helicopter. That means you have to go through this process uh, of learning it, which means it's going to take a certain amount of time, it's going to take a certain amount of experience. Where it's going to change I think is that we're eventually going to realize this, right? And instead of organizing our lives where here's learning and we'll spend some time cramming, cramming, cramming knowledge and then we go to work or whatever, uh, it'll be one single continuum where we live, we work, we learn, it's all part of the same thing. And learning becomes part of what we're doing every day because we know it's the having of experience. It's the spacing of these experiences over time. It's the getting of feedback and reflection on these experiences. So the longer we do it, the more consistently we do it, and, and the more variety we give ourselves as we do it, that's where learning is more effective. So we'll, it'll change that way. But the fundamental, you know, it's not easy to learn Spanish or whatever, that's gonna continue. That won't change because the nature of the brain won't change.